synagogue came and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand. Now, if you read um, Mark, Mark is more explicit. So it begins to tell you the story of how Jairus, who was a leader of the synagogue, a ruler of the synagogue, his daughter died. And of course, he was a Jew, but he knew that he had a problem. So he wasn't going to follow other Pharisees and Sadducees to be saying, Jesus is good, Jesus is not, Jesus is good, Jesus is not. And I always tell people, you don't believe in miracles until you need one. So he knew that this is a desperate situation, and desperate, measure, desperate situations call for desperate measures. So he didn't follow the Pharisees. He went to meet Jesus. He says, so my daughter is dead, or is dying. This one says dead, but Mark tells us that she was still dying. And went to Jesus and said, come and lay your hands on her, and I know she will live. And Jesus said, I felt Jesus wasn't quick to move, but they told him, ah, this guy, help him more. So he followed them, and as they were moving, of course, because Jesus had become very popular. People were hearing about his miracles and things he was doing. So the crowd moved with him. So as they were moving, one woman that had been bleeding for 12 years saw this as her opportunity. That Jesus is not looking for me, but me, I'm looking for him. And I'm asking somebody this morning, you may not feel like Jesus came for you, but do you need Jesus? If you need Jesus, then tap into what he's going to do this morning. And so as he was moving, one woman just used wisdom and said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. She knew that that was the solution to her problem. So as Jesus was moving, she touched him. And Jesus said, virtue has left me. And then they were, Peter was like, what's, what's all this one? What do you mean virtue has left you? See, everybody surrounding you are saying virtue has left you. Of course, virtue has left you. Jesus said, not that type. Somebody has touched me different. And so Jesus turned around, and the woman was afraid, so she came out and she said, oh, I'm the one that touched you. Now, the interesting thing, if you read Mark, is that the Bible says in Mark that she came and began to tell Jesus all her story. So I'm sure that it was as she was giving testimony, because you know what that means, is that Jesus settled down, and that's what I love about Jesus. He makes every single one of us know that we're special. No matter how in a hurry he seemed, he still stopped. To listen to that woman. So he stood there and the woman started to tell story. You know, as worried people go say, start to put story. Start telling her, ah, you don't know when I was young, when I started my period, I went to this doctor. They said period is supposed to be five days, but my own was seven days, even ten. She started talking story, how her mother borrowed cl- money, how her mother sold clothes to be able to go and pay this doctor. She went to that doctor, the doctor saw her, it did not work. She went to different doctors and she went to that. And I'm sure that Jairus must have been shaking his body like this woman. Talk quick, let's be going. But Jesus was there. And this woman finished telling her story. And then Jesus said, go, your faith has made you whole. Say she told all her story. It was not the, the testimony we give in church. It was not that five minutes, once I was blind, now I see. Not that time. She told all her story. So they probably sat there. She finished telling her story. And mind you, this was a woman, not a man. Men can give you summarized version. If a woman tells you all her story, they sat there and finished telling all her story. And by that time, people came from Jairus' house and said, don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. But Jesus said, don't be afraid. Only believe. And Jesus went with him. And I'm trying to tell the story so that we can rush. And Jesus went with him and got to the house and saw the people Outside, they were crying. Some people were wailing. Message translation says that they were busy bodies looking for gossip. So different people were gathered there over this girl's situation. But Jesus said something. Jesus said, this girl is not dead. She's only sleeping. I need you to listen to that for a few seconds. This girl is not dead. She's only sleeping. This was not the first time Jesus made that statement about somebody who was dead. Jesus said the same thing about Lazarus. He says, Lazarus is sleeping. And then Thomas said, thank God he's sleeping. Person where, person where they sleep, you go, well now. That means he's not dead. And Jesus said, you're not understanding what I'm saying. He's dead. But I'm glad I wasn't there. But we're going to wake him up. And that's what I've come to do this morning. I've come to wake you up. Because I know that even though it seems that the thing that God promised you in 2005 has not come to pass. I've come to tell you that your dreams are not dead. They're just sleeping. And if they are sleeping, it means they can wake up. 
that assignment that God gave you since the year 2000 or 2011 maybe even gave it to you last year and you feel like you have failed him let me tell you this morning that dream that assignment will wake up this morning I thought I would hear a louder amen than that but there are keys to reawakening and those are the things you will see from the story very clearly Jesus got there and the first thing he did was to send everybody away let me tell you if you are going to do anything great for God you need intimacy with Jesus you need to be alone with Jesus and Jesus sent everyone outside and he took only her parents and Peter James and John sometimes I wonder why didn't he take the other disciples you self if not you you take the other disciples you see Judas you will take or Thomas that everything if Jesus even says let's leave her he said unless this girl stands up and start dancing Jesus she's not resurrected imagine hearing that kind of doubt all the time Jesus took the three people that he knew got him sometimes it's not the crowd that we need to follow if anything we need to go against the crowd if we're going to do great things for God and I know that everybody in this room every single person in this room God has a clear assignment for you but he needs to get you alone it's not about the activity we do on social media that's not where the power is it's not even in the jumping around that's not where the power is the power is in intimacy with God It's the things that you do when you are hidden that affects the things that you do when you are exposed so Jesus said everybody out and he entered the room with the girl and as he entered that room with her the Bible says that he took her by the hand let Jesus take you by the hand I know you are following plenty of people on social media but are you following Jesus and unfortunately this is a social media generation whether you like it or not that's what passed us this generation but make sure in all you are listening make sure Jesus is taking you by the hand speed is not important you have to know where you are going and if you have not lived this life before the only person that can show you where you are going is the one who even created the map for you in the first place so he said Jesus took her by the hand and she stood up the greatest key to your reawakening is following Jesus the fact that when Jesus holds you by the hand everything changes I tell people that you know in fact in the last couple of months in fact the last one year it's been a roller coaster for me and at some point I was asking Jesus I said the truth is I'm not doing anything different than I've been doing all these years I have been preaching for almost 20 years now I have been doing prayer meetings for years now I haven't done anything different let me tell you what happened different Jesus took me by the hand in 2019 I was I just finished I finished I just finished working out so I was so exhausted I said I'm even tired I can't go upstairs so I was downstairs and while I was downstairs and I said instead of me to just be here saying I'm tired let me make it what it so I started praying sometimes those lazy moments those times where you you know you don't have to be in a in a church building for God to speak to you you have to have that kind of intimacy with him that you know that he's with you all the time and every conversation that you have with him matters so I was just lying down there you know really exhausted I didn't I couldn't go upstairs so it wasn't like I was trying to be spiritual it was that I couldn't go upstairs so I just laid there I said let me go, go pray so I was just praying and I was just having a conversation with the Holy Spirit and he said to me I want to use you I said we've been having this conversation since I, gave, I got born again now which ones I want to use you he said no 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 I want to use you in a different way in 2020 by this time the lockdown had not happened by this time COVID had not started he said I want to use you in a different way next year I said okay what do you want he said I want you to start something called pray with Pastor M and I want you to do it at three o'clock every day it didn't make sense to me I said three o'clock people be at the office how can you be doing prayer meeting at three o'clock is it that you are jobless even me I have work sir 
and it's your work I'm doing. So how can I do meeting at 3 p.m. every day? He said, every day, 3 p.m. I started this thing, and then the lockdown happened, and it went viral. And it occurred to me that there are times God gives you instructions, but if you don't let him hold you by the hand, somebody can say, go help me open that door, and you just be going. But if the person is holding you, there's an extra confidence because he knows something you don't know. He knows why he wants you to open that door because he knows what's on the other side of the door. And so we started praying with Pastor him, and it seemed like, you know, of course, I, and that's the thing about God. Once you are faithful, God will show up in ways you can never imagine. We said, Pray with Pastor M. One, after, one afternoon, just during the prayer meeting, someone just said, oh, I love this moment of 3 p.m. with p.m. And that was it. It became a hashtag. It became a tribe. I'm telling you the difference that it makes is just allowing Jesus to hold your hand. Don't go on your own. Don't act like you know. And in these last days, you are going to need him to hold you more than ever before. You're going to need to live for an audience of one more than ever before. We've been saying those things for a long time and people just think, oh, it's cliche, it's cliche. But let me tell you, there's a reason why Jesus lived the way he lived. Everything he did was to glorify God. Everything he did was for the audience of only God. He was showing us a pattern that a time is coming when that's all that will matter. When we will no longer be afraid of what man can do to you. One of the things, one of the graces I carry is the grace of boldness. As far as it's Jesus that said it, I don't care what the world thinks. A couple of weeks ago, they were dragging me everywhere on social media and I was laughing. I said, please drag me. The more you drag me, the more they know Jesus because the most healed person has sent me. That what did I say? Obey the word. That's what's annoying you people. That I said, wife, submit to your husband. Husband, love your wife. That's all I said. You're angry. I said, I won't even defend myself. You know why? Because there's no point having that conversation. When you die for me, we can have that conversation. But as long as the person that died for me is the person that sent me, I will keep shouting until he returns. And that's the attitude you must have. You know why? Because people who are sinning and living for the other side are not ashamed one morning, I was taking a walk, a prayer walk in my estate. So I was walking in the morning, and usually as I'm walking, I'll be praying in tongues. So at first, I was praying in tongues, and I wasn't even really shouting. I was just muttering over, And one guy, who looked like he was smoking or something, I don't even know what he was doing, was looking at me weird. And at first, I wanted to... We, you know how when people look at you when you're praying in tongues, you don't want them to think you're mad. You don't want them to think that you're talking to yourself. So at first I wanted to master, I wanted to tone it down. And then the Holy Spirit said, really? Are you ashamed of me? Because he doesn't look ashamed of him, what he's doing. It now occurred to me that why are we, even the ones that are doing the right thing, we are now the ones that are ashamed. I know a lot of young girls who are virgins today, but they are ashamed to say it. Oh, I'm not even going to talk about the guys. A lot of the guys that are bragging that they are sleeping around, they are not. They are virgins, good Christian boys, but they don't want to say it. Why? Because you don't want the world to make fun of you. You don't want them to say, you be Juma, you know, no, nah, you be Lena. Yes. And I'm learning from Jesus. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And so when that thing hit me, I said, ah, this guy is not afraid, he's not ashamed. Some of them are even wearing, the, the things they wear, they wear naked and be walking about. And me, I will not be ashamed that I'm covered. No. I said, enough is enough. And that's what I've come to challenge you to do this morning. I need you to make up your mind to stand out. We're not called to blending. We're called to stand out. And so with the guy looking at me, me too, I looked at him. Makai brotosha. I said, makai brotosha. If you don't want to make, just they pass, they go your own. We must get to that point. Jesus said, all these people get out of here. They laughed at him. They were making fun of him. But he knew he was on an assignment. Do you know that you're on an assignment? We don't even have time. Jesus will soon be here. We don't have time. And that's how Jesus deals with things. 
He doesn't really care about what the world is saying. He doesn't care about what anybody else is saying. He doesn't need to prove a point. You must know who you are. Your identity in Christ is the greatest gift that you can have. And if you read the New Testament, Paul kept saying it in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. You have these gifts in Christ. This is who you are in Christ. He kept saying it. That tells me that there's something very important about our identity. It's more important than what we do. Have you ever wondered why we're called human beings and not human doings? Because it's about being. It's about being. Nicodemus went to Jesus. He said, no man can do the things you do except Christ be with him. Jesus said, you have it mixed up. Except a man be, he cannot do. So we must get to the point where we understand more about our identity than what we do. A lot of people are moved by, oh, somebody's... See, when we get to heaven, we're going to be very shocked though. Ah, we're going to be very shocked. It's not about the things you do. It's about who you are. It's about whose child you are. And it takes boldness to be confident in your identity. So this is the seasoning for reawakening. That dream, that vision, that plan that God has placed in your hands. So now that you are awake, don't behave like you are dead. Jesus woke that girl. He took her hand and she stood up. He didn't tell her, lie down back and rest. She stood up from there. How do you live when you have been reawakened? I'll give you maybe two or three. Number one, by living right. I am so in love with the foundation scripture for this conference. So in love. I've read it in every, like, you know how you go on you version and you read it, you go to the next one, you read it. Like, every version is so good. So good. Like, you know how you are literally, I'm literally drooling over the word. It's so good. Let me, let me read to you. I don't know. Let, let me start. Let me, let me use the Living Bible because I, I couldn't decide, to be honest, guys. I couldn't decide. But this scripture, if you take this scripture and just run with it, you are good till Jesus comes. Romans 13 from verse 11, Living Bible. It says, another reason for living right is this. It says, you know how late it is. Time is running out. If by now, looking around you, you don't know that Jesus is coming soon, I don't know what else I can do to help you. He says, time is running out. So he says, wake up, for the coming of the Lord is nearer now than when we first believed. Next verse. The night is far gone. The day of his return will soon be here. He says, so quit the evil deeds of darkness and put on the armor of right living. Right living is an armor. It shows that we are ready. You know, I always tell people we are war, guys. When people, when people are so focused on the, the minor things, I'm confused. Because I hear people, and I pastor, okay, I pastor. So I hear people make silly complaints like, oh, I'm leaving my department, they annoyed me. And I'm like, okay, what happened? Oh, they greeted everybody on their birthday, they didn't wish me happy birthday on my birthday. True story. I heard this so much for one year that what I now did with the workforce was I now put a new law. From now, we don't celebrate birthday. At the beginning of the year, I will go there and write happy birthday to every worker in Davis Christian Center. God bless you. Please, when it is your turn in the month, take your happy birthday from here. Start it. Why? Because it became a distraction. We are so focused on the minor things. I don't like the way she spoke to me. That's why you are leaving the assignment that God Almighty placed in your hands. Because you don't like the way somebody spoke to you. You know why you are thinking like this? It's because you are not looking at the fact that you are at war. Is it all right if I take off my shoes? This shoe is dolly me. Sorry. Pastor K, I'm sorry. Wherever you are. I can't understand. Imagine that you are at war. 
Imagine that you are at war. Pastor Emisi is here. Pastor Emisi, please just come. Please, where's your husband? Please come. Please stay here. Please stay here. We're at war. Cover me. Then shoot me anyhow. Stay here. Please stay like this. Don't stay near your wife because you'll be tempted to cover and not me. Stay here. Three of us are at war. And we're supposed to shoot. He needs to shoot me. And I'm running and I need to change my bullets because I'm running out of bullets. And I'm about to change. Then he needs to cover me and she said, I'm not covering you because she's covering me now. But just imagine. He needs to not even cover like that. Now they will shoot you. <laughs> okay, they don't even know this work. I need another pastor. Okay, this one does not know this work. <laughs> Imagine that we're at war. This is a life-threatening situation. They are shooting us. And then I say, Missy, come on, let me change my blood. And she says, I'm not covering you because you don't wish me happy birthday. Wow. Husband and wife. Come on. Two of you are the greatest. Stand together. Stand together. You can't give each other COVID. You're coming from the same bed. <laughs> Imagine these two people. Now, she's supposed to be covering her husband in prayer. That is because the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. So she's going to use, she's going to use prayer. She's going to pull down uh, mindsets. She's going to pull down every tongue that is exalted, every tongue that speaks against anything. She's going to, she's covering him. And then she says, oh, he did not remember our wedding anniversary. I'm not covering him again. He's gone. These are the things that we do. The reason why we don't pay attention is because we can't really see it. If you can see it, you can understand it. If you understand that you are at war, why would they tell us we have weapons if we are not at war? The Satan that you are playing with is not playing with you. He's not playing with you. He has a strategy. He has a plan and he has an army. And we don't understand this. We're so busy bickering that we're losing the battle. So busy fighting over things that are irrelevant. I have to tell her, I say no more birthday. If that's what's causing the problem, happy birthday. In January, oh yeah, share it throughout the rest of the year. Because if that's what is bringing offense, Jesus said offense will come. But blessed is he who is not offended in me. Offense will come. It will come. He didn't say it may come. It will come. John the Baptist was his cousin. He was in jail. He sent message because Jesus was busy delivering other people. He says, sir, you're supposed to be Messiah. Are you the one or should we wait for another one? Jesus said, go and tell him what you see. That I'm busy taking care of other people. I can't come to him, but he'll be fine. Is that not enough reason to be offended? And right after that, Jesus said, offense will come. But blessed is he who is not offended in me. Who does not take offense in the things that I do? So whether he's answering you now or he's not answering you, he's still God. And the king must be worshipped. And newsflash, you are not the king. So you do not dictate how God works. We have a, a set of new believers who believe that they have a God who they can control with remotes. So if I need him to do something, I'll just worship him. If he's not doing it on time, I'll just give offering, I'll give seed. He's God. And then if they say he's not doing anything, they now start threatening him. If you don't give me husband by December 31st, I'll backslide. As if your backsliding can de-God him or un-God him or dis-God him or in-God him or a-God him. I don't even know the English to speak. He's God. Not to be controlled. If you understand that this is the person who we are called to answer to, you will take this work you are doing with a little bit of reverence. You will get to heaven. And you will stand with the likes of Paul, who was flogged many times. 39 strokes. Save, I mean, 40 strokes save one. That's 39 strokes. Shipwreck. He was stoned to death many times. He was falsely accused, persecuted. You will stand with heaven and they will be sharing their testimonies. See my scars. Let no man trouble me. I bet, see, on oh, my body, the master will say, see my scars. He'll be boasting. This one say, oh, you, that's small. I was hung upside down for Jesus. And the person say, I was boiled in hot oil. Uh, they will not say, Pastor Missy, what happened? You say, oh, there's somebody in my church that annoyed me. I say, I'm not pastoring again. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You need to see the big picture. And that's why I'm here this morning. I need you to see the big picture. It's no more church as usual. It's no more. And it's no more about us doing it in church. 
You can't be a Christian on Sunday. And then Monday through Saturday, you are worse than Satan himself. Sometimes when people call themselves Christian, you want to dis-Christian yourself so that you will not be associated with them. We're ambassadors of Christ. We need to remember that. Thank you. So he says, put on the armor of right living as we who live in the daylight should. He says, be decent and true in everything you do so that all can approve your behavior. He says, don't spend time in wild parties. Can you imagine? This is in the Bible. So those questions of, should I go for the party? You know that party is wild. Why do you want to go there, auntie? Even children's parties. I'm going to touch that. There are some children's parties that me, I'm even afraid as an adult to go. Where is it in the Bible that we must celebrate first birthday? Where, where, where? I'm not saying you shouldn't celebrate, oh. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is don't use it as an excuse. Because even some of the music, and you know, children are not too young for these things to enter. We need to be conscious, even our parenting. We need to be conscious we're part of a kingdom, a part of an agenda. The unbelievers are causing the tea. YouTube is not in partnership with you to raise your children. Disney is not in partnership with you to raise your children. It is your sole responsibility. So don't just put there, go and watch. When you see what they are doing there. So on first day of birthdays, when I, me, me, I have to stop going. My children don't go. If it's not, the parties, if it's not a children's party, my children don't go. Because the children's party, adults, you come for children's party, your skirt is here and you still slit it. And see, what are you trying to do, sir? Because I don't even know if you're in my side anymore. You will now wear clothes that we don't, it doesn't have top, it doesn't have bottom. We don't know where it's starting from, where it's ending for a first year birthday. And children are there. And then you'll be dancing on the other side, twerking. And children are following you to twerk. They will now become videoing it. And Satan is laughing. Because you are helping him fulfill his agenda. Meanwhile, the assignment God gave you, which is to raise him godly seed, is not being carried out. And mind you, godly seed is not good behaved children. Godly seed is seed that has the nature of God. So we should be raising spiritual children who can quote the scriptures. Something happened the other day that even threw me off. Me, I know that it's Jesus that is holding my hand. It's not that I'm such, I'm, I know the work like that. It's God. Somebody was joking with my son in church. Saw him, David, he's, he's six now, but at that time he was still five. I said to him, uh, Babs Carpenters, said to him, ah, David, I like your edges. Please give me small. My son leaned back. He said, come. And Babs now came. He now put his hand on his head. I don't even know what the boy was saying. He said, go. Uh, <laughs> Babs and I were so blown away. See, children are watching Ah, children are watching and they learn more from what they see than what they hear. He says, don't spend your time in wild parties, in getting drunk, or in adultery, in lust, in fighting, or in jealousy. The amount of fighting that is going on in the body is amazing. And when I say body, I don't mean churches. I mean fellow Christians. You are in the same office with another Christian and you are doing everything to pull her down to take her place. How do you sleep at night? How do you wake up in the morning and say, Lord Jesus, he can't be your Lord. He can't be your Lord. If he's your Lord, you will do everything he says. You don't care. Only Christians do these things. And not even people who say they are nominal Christians. I'm talking about born again Christians. The way they speak in tongues, in the office, even that office work, let me touch it because I have to go there. You are in the office, you are supposed to resume at nine, you stroll in at ten with one story or the other. Who are you disgracing? Is it not Jesus? Because you know, when people say, when people talk about people who do these things in the office, they don't say, and I worked a secular job for years, so I know, they don't say things like, Oh, and she calls herself Mildred. They will say, and she calls herself a Christian. They never go for you. They attack what you stand for or what you should stand for. You're in the office making private calls with office 
data, uh, credits. You are downloading movies with office data. It's amazing the things people are doing. Everything you do, you would be held accountable for. Everything. There was a time when I was much younger, Pastor Missy. When I was much younger, there was a time that when people wanted to employ people, they would say, please, I want SU. Yes. There was a time. Now, can people say, I want Christian? And when you put the Christian, you won't be using prayer to gauge the Christian. Is it possible? We need to wake up. Tell your neighbor, wake up. I think we even need to first wake up before we reawaken. Let's first wake up. Tell your neighbor, wake up. Are you angry? I've not even gotten to the place that will make you angry in the next 10 minutes. Don't be angry yet. Save it. And even if you're angry, it's okay because your anger, don't sin. That's all. But they didn't say you should not be angry, but don't sin. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. Don't worry. It says, but ask the Lord Jesus to help you live as you should. And see the part that blew me away. Don't make plans to enjoy evil. Because God knows us. You know there's a way you are planning to do bad things. And you are looking for the way to make it look right. Evil is evil. As they say, let's call a spade a spade. Don't call it a famine implement. A spade is a spade. The other day, when they passed the heartbeat bill, that if, in Texas, that if there's a heartbeat in the child, you're not allowed to abort the child. So I was talking about how, on my, my page, I was talking about how excited I was about it, that this, I mean, this even makes sense. Once there's heart, it's no heartbeat that determines whether somebody's alive. So why do we now say there's a heartbeat that the child is not alive, it's just blood, just flush, I'm not seeing matter. So I was really excited about it, and I was saying it on my page. And then someone comes there and says, eh, so what about the, you're not thinking about the life of the mother? I say, anybody that has anything here, even if it's water, not brain, should know that that's not what we're talking about here. But people have found a way to, to excuse evil. We all want to be politically correct. Let me tell you, you have to be careful of being politically correct and spiritually wrong. Too many people. Ah, you don't want people to be offended. If you say the name of Jesus too much on your page, let's hide it. You know, we are undercover agents. Uh, you know, let's, let's not allow people to know quickly that we are Christians. Uh, look at Esther. Esther, when Mordecai told her that she should not say she was a Jew. Uh, are you a slave? Esther was a slave. Are you in captivity? Esther was in captivity. Please, what's your excuse? Are you trying to marry the king? What's your excuse? We only make excuses when it's convenient. And when it was now time, and this is another reason why we need to be careful of this hiding Jesus. I mean, I always say it though. Let's hide Jesus. Let's hide Jesus. Small time, we go hide and we don't go know where we keep him. We go begin find him. Be bold. Be bold. Don't be ashamed to say who you are and to live up to it. A lot of times, why we don't want people to know we're Christians is because we don't want to live up to it. And today that comes to an end. Tell your neighbor, wake up. 